Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the woods and welcome back to another episode of My Woodland Life. I'm up here with Dad and today we have quite a bit of work to do. I want to thank Jackery for sponsoring this episode. We brought up with us the Jackery Explorer 1000 portable power station and we hope to put it to good use because we brought some battery tools up with us and we need to get a lot of work done. So get ready for a test on that and I will talk a bit more about that later in the episode. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for joining us. Let's crack on. So we're just taking a break from splitting up the wood. Uh, we're about to get the fire going and have some lunch, but I just wanted to quickly show you. The Jackery is currently in action. You might be able to hear a fan on this Makita charger, and that's because it's a fast charger as well, uh, and it's a double one. But we've just charged up the three amp battery and it took 20 minutes on the Jackery to do the three amp battery. We've just run out of battery on the five amp and that's now charging up. So I'm expecting it to be probably double, just over double the time because of the double the power of the size of the battery, 5 amp. So we're expecting about a 40 minute charge, even on this fast charger. You can hear the fan going in the Jackery as well, if I move that away. That's firing away. And it's drawing, it's, it's doing output there, if you can just see that. The charger, the Makita charger is drawing about 127 watts, up to 150 watts. Yeah, see it jumps there. So fluctuates obviously but averaging about 130 watts it was on 67 percent today uh 64 i think it was when we started it's now on 56 it's doing well plenty of power there and um yeah we're just going to rotate these batteries each time Crack, I think it is. We might as well just finish that. Did it go on the crack and keep one short, one wide? Sort of needs to uh, keep it straight. Uh, your ear defenders are there, Dad. You want to put them on? Okay. And then 
then um it's got it now, right? Yeah, I think it is actually. We're almost there, people. The uh, the way the log burnt today, we uh, we did it slightly differently. But um, normally we don't do Swedish logs this way. We we open it up a bit more. <clears throat> but we didn't have the pliers to get rid of the wire, uh, the top wire. So it was quite tight. So there was not much airflow. But mm. look, it does the job. You just got to stand by it a bit because it's wobbling. We did build the fire up this side so you could leave the frying pan. But because it's sausages and egg, it, it's so easy to cook. Mind you, even we can screw that up, can't we, Dad? Well. <laughs> It's edible. Yeah. yeah. We didn't do too bad, Dad. No. No cremated sausage this time. No. It's, it's going to turn out very nice, in fact. It's a great day. It's a shame. We've actually had some storms. We've had three back-to-back -back storms uh, about two weeks ago. I can't remember the names of them now. All I remember was Eunice and Dudley, was it? She was a bad one, Eunice. Eunice was a bad one. Um, and then we had another one after that, I think. But basically, uh, a lot of you guys asked, how was the woods? Did things survive? Mm. Uh, because the woods, the trees everywhere around us took a battering all around where we live. Trees in the roads and things like that. You really, lost one, didn't you? Yeah, really strong winds. But thankfully, the main woods in here uh, is clear. There's nothing that's come down other than the odd small hazel. The main uh, tree that came down was actually into the field, the farmer's field, and that was an ash tree. Thankfully, it wasn't a massive one like the one we've been milling up here, but... Um, we, were, we managed to manage it with uh, the battery chainsaw, actually. I was quite impressed with it. So that Oregon one. So we managed to get, we spent about half a day, didn't we, Dad? Bit of hedge laying, didn't you? Some hedge yeah, we finished again. some hedge laying with the chainsaw. Uh, I say finished it, it's an ongoing job, that. But we, uh, we managed to trim and limb that ash tree, get it all back over to our boundary. And then, um, yeah, we've got some firewood now for, mm. for down the line. And, and that ash tree, we can leave part of that ash tree there, certainly to decompo decompose. We can get Ryan to do the big bits of yeah, there's some stump. You know? There's some bits that are a bit too big for the, the current chainsaw I've got. But um, yeah, since then, um, we haven't been to the woods much, too much. It's been a while actually since I've been here, a couple of weeks. But back at it now, we've got things to do. We've got projects in mind. This is why we're here today, uh, basically splitting these planks in half. Yeah. Because the ash tree, if you remember guys, was huge. It was like bigger than off the screen, yeah. And um, the problem is, is those planks it creates are for what we want to use them for, too big. So we're gonna split them in half and uh, answers on a postcard, please, who can guess what we're going to be doing with them. Um, hopefully you will find out in an episode or two's time of what we're going to be making. But yeah, it needed to be done. And we were trying to think of a way that we could split the planks in half out here in the woods, obviously, rather than bringing it back. And um, I had myself a little battery circular saw, really, and the Makita one. It works a treat. It's actually been really Impressive, good today, yeah. hasn't it? More so, so the recycle on the batteries. Yeah, so Very obviously impressed. being able to recharge it has made a big difference. Um, so that's why we brought the Jackery, which is fairly heavy, the Jackery 1000, but that's why we brought it with us. We've recycled those batteries a couple mm. of times now, and we're able to stay out here longer doing it and not have to have too many kind of cables around all the place. We can just freely move it. And yeah, it's been really good to be fair. So that's been our plan for today, the main job. Mm. We've also got another few smaller tasks that we're hopefully going to try and get done before the rain comes at four o'clock. Yeah, we're, we're fighting it, but you saw on the way yeah. in, <clears throat> because they've had storms, I guess not, a lot of people haven't been moving around. No. What was a deer? We saw a really big deer. We saw coming two, in. two road deer. And actually, I had a look at my trail cams. Yeah. And I've finally picked up some small, I think one of them might have been a rabbit. One of the other ones might have been a hare. It's quite a bit bigger. But we're starting to pick up, you know, I've moved the cameras around a few times now. So we're starting to pick up footage yeah. on the trail cameras, which and is that's great. here, close right that's in the here, camp. filming the camp. I thought, I'll film mm. this way, because I could see signs of deer and rabbits that had come through this, this bit. So I thought, I'll just film the camp. And actually, uh, quite surprised with how confident they are coming right up to the wood here, yeah. so in the tarp. And you said they're eating the um, bluebells. Mm. Top of the bluebells have been nibbled. Nibbling, all that I'll show you in a minute. So we just had some food, had a nice little break. I thought I'd just quickly show you 
the Jackery 1000, the unit that we're basically using to recharge the circular saw. I've had this for nearly a year now. I take it to the bushcraft show each year uh, where I use it to kind of charge up my lights uh, in my stand, in my stall that's highlighting all my products and things like that. And I also use the solar panels because it's in the summer, the bushcraft show, and I use the two solar panels that I've got for it. And they've been great for just keeping it on a constant recharge so that it doesn't really ever run out for the whole five days that I'm there. They also do a smaller one, almost half a size, which is I think the Jackery 500, much more portable, uh, kind of more ideal for taking out actual camping in your backpack and things like that. This obviously is not going in my backpack. This is more for my car camping and things like that. But I've taken it out here in the woods because we just use the wheelbarrow to get all our gear up often and we drive in. Uh, so it's just easier when it's that access is there. So it's got two AC ports here, which you can power on and off by this AC button. So if you look then the output is on zero at the moment. And when you put it in, the little fan goes and it just charges up ready. So then it sits at five watts and then that's ready to plug in your, your main voltage in the UK, certainly with these plugs, your main voltage appliances. Today is the circular saw charger, the double charger. But over here, it's also got DC outlets uh, and it's got a USB-C there, another USB-C there, and then two 3.0 USB charge points there, and a 12 volt, 12 volt charge point there. So all really easy to access as well, right on the front. Uh, and then up here is the inputs for the solar panels. So that's where you plug in the solar panels when you need to. Uh, and it's got a fairly long cable with them, so you can put them either outside of your car and things like that. So you could have this inside the car and the solar panels outside. Uh, and then there's a button here which is for the display because this display goes to sleep and it's great because it tells you the wattage the input here of, the, of what watts are going in and the output of what watts are coming out what 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 <laughs> and the percentage which is at 30 38 percent at, at the moment but in the beginning of this video is at about 64 percent it has a 46.4 amp lithium battery capacity that can recharge in about seven hours i've found overall there is a 12 volt a uh, car adapter, which takes about 14 hours to charge it up. And then, like I said earlier, I've got the two Solar Saga 100 watt solar panels, and they can recharge it in about eight hours, which is quite impressive. What do you think, Dad? Do you reckon we can finish these planks yeah, yeah, we get in it the done. next get couple it, of Dad. hours? Get it done. We've got to stack them all up. We've got to put got them all, all behind there, and then we've got to restack them yeah. and uh, keep before the, the rain comes Using and keep the them under the tarp. Yeah, we've got to space, it, space them all out. So we've got a good couple of hours work left to do. Um, and then hopefully we might be able to squeeze in another project if we can at the end of this episode. But let's crack on. So we've done the majority of the planks now. As you can see, what was the main trunk of the tree, which was easily double the width of these, we've now halved them. And the reason being is that we get two pieces of wood with the live edge. Otherwise, if we put it up, which you'll find out what we're doing soon, uh, we're going to lose one piece of the live edge but this way we've always got a live edge on one side and we've got a nice relatively straight edge on the other side to work with. So now we've got to get all those stacked back up here. And what we're doing is we're putting spaces again still, like there, on top. But this time obviously the planks are in two pieces. Some of them have cracks, which is naturally where the tree fell over, um, but most of them have actually been pretty good and we've kind of run off these cracks when, it, when they do they tend to go down the middle, so we've kind of done well there. What are your thoughts, Dad? 28 to 30, I think there is. Is there? Maybe 30 to somewhere. They've got 30 planks. 30? Yeah, and we haven't cut the rest of the tree up yet. I know, look. Out there, we've still got Ryan to come back to do some more milling and get more planks. But we've made good progress. Pleased with that. Let's get stacking. Oh, that one needs to be flipped. Flipped over here. This side. Flip it, yeah. One of the things I forgot to mention at the beginning of this episode is that soon after Ryan had milled up the first planks from the ash tree, 
I actually gave the ends a coating of PVA glue. This helps to seal the wood and reduce the speed at which moisture leaves it. It helps to slow down the drying process and therefore leads to less cracking and warping as it dries. Some of the planks have naturally cracked anyway, due to the impact of the tree hitting the woodland floor as it fell. Thankfully, most of these cracks seem to run straight down the middle of the boards, which works well as we use these to our advantage when splitting the planks down the middle to get the live edge. And so, fast forward a few days and Ryan was back with his chainsaw mill. This time, he used it to create some really interesting things from the main trunk of the ash tree, which will prove to be very useful down the line as we look to do more projects. To begin with, he rigged up the mill on his running ladder system and took off the top section of the main trunk so that he had a flat surface to work from. Once Ryan had squared off the main trunk, Dad had the idea of a small project that we could do for some of the other logs that were left over when we were limbing the tree. And so Ryan got to work on cutting a small round, about two inches thick, which we will put to use later in the episode, so keep an eye out for it. So we're a few days later from when I was here with Dad, and we're, Ryan is back. We are on to the last, pretty much the last of the big ash tree. This is the main trunk down near the base where it fell off. Uh, and Ryan's gonna show us an interesting technique um, to basically make some posts using the, the chainsaw mill on this, this log here. So basically what we're gonna do to make some posts out of this, a little bit sort of difficult to explain to begin with, but we've got a first cut set on top, um, ready for the chainsaw mill to run on. That's our first side of the post. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this um, high lift jack, quite popular with the Land Rover community. Um, one of those tools that don't use very often, but when you do find a use for it, it's about the best tool for the job. Um, basically, this is going to go under this side of the log uh, and we're going to lift it and roll it um, and then we're going to cut another 90 degree on this side um, and then we're going to run off of those cuts to then create a three-sided uh, sort of almost square that then we can run the chainsaw mill off to get our post out of and it will become a little bit more apparent as we get a bit further along um, and you see what's going on. Track them under. And basically, they've just got a it's a little bit of a long process, but some power in that, though. This uh, <laughs> you can almost, you can literally like lift yeah. the log with cut the fingers. So it's really not difficult. But what we've got to do is just be careful of uh, of it slipping out, so we don't want to go too far. Um, and also, this handle, once the tension, that log is tension on the handle. So if I was to let go of that, that springs up with some serious force. So we just want to make sure we're out of the way and clear from that. Basically all it is is a two pin system and you lift the log up, one pin engages um, and then the other ratchet mechanism brings a second pin up to engage in the series of holes and then just allows it to progress up the up the rail. And then as we get a bit closer, what we do is take some of these off cuts of wood we've got and we'll just brace this under here. And then what we can do is once we get to a point where we think it might be getting a bit too hairy, we'll just disengage that and then start again. So yeah, you think if you were trying to do this any other way, you'd, you'd never move this by hand. You can get what's called PVs, which are like a... Uh, a hook on a stick that hooks into the wood and then turns it. Yeah. Once you get up to that pivot, because we've taken a bit of the stability off the side, it can just carry on rolling once the weight goes yeah. over the centre. This is a, it's a bit of a crude technique, so you know, we, we basically just want to centre the ladder so that we're running square with the cut that we've already done. Obviously, there's plenty more like band mills and things like that will run far more accurate and, and sort of get a much better, much better product. But for a crude sort of measure in the, in the woodland that um, sort of where you can't get a band mill or something like that to the tree, this, this works just as well. And, and you know, the, the sort of usage of the post depends on sort of where 
where and what you want to use it for um, and this will be fairly accurate we'll have a measure of it afterwards and just have a look and see how accurate um, but we'll just uh, we'll just try and get it sort of as near as we can um, with the square and then the chainsaw mill doesn't cut 100% accurate anyway and that's pretty yeah it's pretty close it's touching at the ends of the posts will have a little bit of wane on them so the the very ends you'll probably lose a bit of the diameter because just to get the saw started when we do the next set of cuts um on when we cut the actual post off sometimes it sort of doesn't sit perfectly level yeah so by the time the the chain engages you've probably sort of it, it wobbles about it's gonna so give, you sort yeah. of expect to lose a little bit but again it's turning something that wouldn't be a product that's useful into something that's a bit better and then we just Hopefully, that. I mean, it's not perfect. It's pretty good, day. But for something doing it as a crude measure with a chainsaw, you know. Ryan then rigged up the mill again and set the cutting depth to four inches. This was to be the thickness of the posts he would make. Once he cut off one large slab, we slid it off the main trunk and turned it on its side. This then allowed Ryan to quickly run the mill over it at the same depth of four inches. And within less than five minutes, he had created an eight foot long, four by four inch ash post. He then repeated this a number of times. And before we knew it, Ryan had made four of these posts in just a matter of minutes. We were really impressed with this simple yet resourceful technique. And had it not been for Ryan, we would never have thought about making posts this way. The price of lumber in the UK at the moment is very high, and so these posts were actually worth quite a bit. But we are not looking to sell them, but to put them to good use in a project, which you will see in a video soon. For the next hour or so, Ryan repeated this process and got to work on making as many posts as possible from the main trunk of the tree. It was so nice to know that none of this majestic tree would go to waste. And it was great to see the variety of different styles and sizes of wood that could be made from it. What really stood out to me was the beautiful markings on the wood. It almost seemed a shame to be making posts from it. But we still have so much of it that can be crafted into something aesthetically pleasing for camp. We left Ryan to it and began work on clearing some of the area around the camp. After the multiple storms that had hit the UK recently, there was a significant amount of hazel that had been blown down. It made things difficult when carrying wood back and forward to the tarp. Of course, Dad got to work on arguably the most important job of the day, getting the fire going for a brew. Once Ryan had finished the main section of the tree, he set the mill to cut at a depth of two inches and slabbed up the remaining tree section into planks. Whilst he was busy doing that, we got to work on splitting these planks in half so that we could get two planks with a live edge. We had now formed a pretty efficient production line and with the weather conditions finally on our side, it was great to get so much progress done in just a few hours. We had to rearrange the wood under the tarp as we had now doubled the amount of planks that we had made originally. We cut up some spacers too and began to stack the posts under here. With the wood neatly stacked ready to be left to air dry, we started to work on Dad's little project he had in mind. Remember that round piece of wood that Ryan had cut earlier? Well, we cut up some small section of hazel, about an inch in diameter. Essentially, we were forming a small border around the edge. Dad, what have you got there? It looks like a cutting board for a kitchen, but in fact, it's going to be our raptor nesting table, as you can see. We're probably going to get Ryan to screw it, yeah. drill it and screw it, 
That will go right up on the top of the tree which we want to leave up there. On one of the ones we monolith. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So there's a flat platform that. already up there. And you could just put some sticks and that up as well. And uh, it was my start for a buzzard or Have you seen this kite. before? Like, has, do you think it's going to work? Have you seen it done before? Yeah, yeah. If you, yeah. If you look online, there's loads of places that do it. They, they put them on different power poles in America. Do them a lot for ospreys. So let's see. It's if a nesting work. table. We've made a rustic nesting table from the ash. It's a rustic ash. nesting table for a. Well, they call them raptors, don't they? The only raptor we've Bird got really is the uh, red politicians kite and the buzzards and, and those as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's where I'd like to put them all. Up. <laughs> nail them all at the top out of the way. <laughs> God, what a mess. Yeah. Well, let's hope we've got buzzards in the area. We've seen two. So yeah. if we can get them nesting, that'd be awesome up on there. Absolutely, yeah. So be something to watch. You'll pick them up going through the trees eventually. Yeah. If not, we'll get squirrels. We're giving them a helping hand, Dad. Yeah, we are. We've got some twigs. I'll take one and throw it out. Yeah, don't let them carry them up twice. Whilst we had Ryan here for the day, and he had all the gear, he helped to cut back the remaining section of the ash tree that had fallen into the field a few weeks before. Thankfully, I hadn't got to hedge laying this section yet, otherwise it would have been destroyed. But with the ash tree out of the way, I now have enough of an area to continue the hedge laying and get to work on trying to finish this section before spring is in full flow. Once spring is here, I won't be doing any more hedge laying until next winter. And so, the day was coming to an end. We had made great work on the ash tree, or should I say, Ryan had made great work on the ash tree. But it felt good to finally process the remainder of the tree. Now we are ready to put the wood to use, and create some awesome projects from it. Be sure to keep an eye out for them on the channel in the weeks to come. A big thank you to Ryan for helping us out for the day, and also to my dad, be sure to check out his YouTube channel, TA Fishing, for weekly content. This is it, folks. The ash tree is pretty much cleared out now, and there's a lovely big space in the woods that this has opened up. We've still got some, some wood to carry over to the camp here, and obviously some remaining wood here. This root system is going to biodegrade naturally. We just leave that. It looks amazing. So we'll let that go back to nature. But we've got so much wood that we can use thanks to Ryan. Look at all this space of where this tree just went boom, flattened everything in its path and now we've got all this space here that's opened up the woodlands and even here through the sawdust that, that shows you how hardy bluebells are as a plant. They're starting to come up through all this thick layer of sawdust. So the rest of it we've slabbed up ready for a bit, a bit more firewood throughout the winter. The wind's picking up now 
There we go, folks. Look at all this wood. This is all from the, the three kind of main ash trunks that Ryan had split up. And today, we made really good progress and we've got these nice 4x4 squared off sections that we can use for posts and everything like that. We've raised them on pallet wood again just to keep the airflow. And we've got so many more planks for cladding and all sorts. A couple of nice chopping boards there as well that Ryan's done. So, plenty of wood for projects down the line. And also I'd like to say a huge thank you to Jackery for sponsoring the episode. I'm going to put a link to all of their gear and the different sites that you can get it from in the description below. Thank you for watching guys and I'll catch you in the next one.